Sketches by Boz, Section 17. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, Section 17. Scenes, Chapter 10. The River. Are you fond of the water? is a question very frequently asked in hot summer weather by amphibious-looking young men. Very, is the general reply. Ain't you? Hardly ever off it, is the response, accompanied by sundry adjectives expressive of the speaker's heartfelt admiration of that element. Now, with all respect for the opinion of society in general, and cutter clubs in particular, we humbly suggest that some of the most painful reminiscences in the mind of every individual who has occasionally disported himself on the Thames must be connected with his aquatic recreations. Who ever heard of a successful water-party, or, to put the question in a still more intelligible form, who ever saw one? We have been on water excursions out of number, but we solemnly declare that we cannot call to mind one single occasion of the kind, which was not marked by more miseries than any one would suppose could be reasonably crowded into the space of some eight or nine hours. Something has always gone wrong. Either the cork of the salad dressing has come out, or the most anxiously expected member of the party has not come out, or the most disagreeable man in company would come out, or a child or two have fallen into the water, or the gentleman who undertook to steer has endangered everybody's life all the way, or the gentlemen who volunteered to row have been out of practice, and performed very alarming evolutions, putting their oars down into the water, and not being able to get them up again, or taking terrific pulls without putting them in at all. In either case, pitching over on the backs of their heads with startling violence, and exhibiting the soles of their pumps to the sitters in the boat, in a very humiliating manner. We grant that the banks of the Thames are very beautiful at Richmond and Twickingham, and other distinct havens, often sought though seldom reached, but from the Redus back to Blackfriars Bridge the scene is wonderfully changed. The penitentiary is a noble building, no doubt, and the sportive youths who go in at that particular part of the river on a summer's evening may be all very well in perspective. But when you are obliged to keep in shore coming home, and the young ladies will colour up and look perseveringly the other way, while the married dittos cough slightly and stare very hard at the water, you feel awkward, especially if you happen to have been attempting the most distant approach to sentimentality for an hour or two previously. Although experience and suffering have produced in our minds the result we have just stated, we are by no means blind to a proper sense of the fun which a looker-on may extract from the amateurs of boating. What can be more amusing than Searle's Yard on a fine Sunday morning? It's a Richmond tide, and some dozen boats are preparing for the reception of the parties who have engaged them. Two or three fellows, in great rough trousers and Guernsey shirts, are getting them ready by easy stages, now coming down the yard with a pair of skulls and a cushion, then having a chat with the Jack, who, like all his tribe, seems to be wholly incapable of doing anything but lounging about, then going back again and returning with a rudder-line and a stretcher, then solacing themselves with another chat, and then wondering, with their hands in their capacious pockets, where them gentlemen's got to as ordered the six. One of them, the headman, with the legs of his trousers carefully tucked up at the bottom to admit the water, we presume, for it is an element in which he is infinitely more at home than on land, is quite a character, and shares with a defunct oyster-swallower the celebrated name of Dando. Watch him, as taking a few minutes' respite from his toils, he negligently seats himself on the edge of a boat, and fans his broad, bushy chest with a cap scarcely half so furry. Look at his magnificent, though reddish, whiskers, and mark the somewhat native humour with which he chafes the boys and prentices, or cunningly gammons the gentleman in the gift of a glass of gin, of which we verily believe he swallows in one day as much as any six ordinary men, without ever being one atom the worse for it. But the party arrives, and Dando, relieved from his state of uncertainty, starts up into activity. 
they approach in full aquatic costume with round blue jackets striped shirts and caps of all sizes and patterns from the velvet skull-cap of french manufacture to the easy head-dress familiar to the students of the old spelling-books as having on the authority of the portrait formed part of the costume of the rev mr dilworth this is the most amusing time to observe a regular sunday water-party there has evidently been up to this period no inconsiderable degree of boasting on everybody's part relative to his knowledge of navigation the sight of the water rapidly cools their courage and the air of self-denial with which each of them insists on somebody else's taking an oar is perfectly delightful at length after a great deal of changing and fidgeting consequent upon the election of a stroke oar the inability of one gentleman to pull on this side of another to pull on that and of a third to pull at all the boat's crew are seated shove her off cries the coxswain who looks as easy and comfortable as if he were steering in the bay of biscay the order is obeyed the boat is immediately turned completely round and proceeds towards westminster bridge amidst such a splashing and struggling as never was seen before except when the royal george went down back water sir shouts dando back water you sir aft upon which everybody thinking he must be the individual referred to they all back water and back comes the boat stern first to the spot whence it started back water you sir aft pull round you sir for ad can't you shouts dando in a frenzy of excitement pull round tom can't you re-echoes one of the party tom ain't for ad replies another yes he is cries a third and the unfortunate young man at the immediate risk of breaking a blood vessel pulls and pulls until the head of the boat fairly lies in the direction of vauxhall bridge that's right now pull all on you shouts dando again adding in an undertone to somebody by him blowed if ever i see such a set of muffs and away jogs the boat in a zigzag direction every one of the six oars dipping into the water at a different time and the yard is once more clear until the arrival of the next party a well contested rowing match on the thames is a very lively and interesting scene the water is studded with boats of all sorts kinds and descriptions places in the coal barges at the different wharfs are let to crowds of spectators beer and tobacco flow freely about men women and children wait for the start in breathless expectation cutters of six and eight oars glide gently up and down waiting to accompany their protégés during the race bands of music add to the animation if not to the harmony of the scene groups of watermen are assembled at the different stairs discussing the merits of the respective candidates and the prize wary which is rowed slowly about by a pair of skulls is an object of general interest two o'clock strikes and everybody looks anxiously in the direction of the bridge through which the candidates for the prize will come half past two and the general attention which has been preserved so long begins to flag when suddenly a gun is heard and a noise of distant hurrahing along each bank of the river every head is bent forward the noise draws nearer and nearer the boats which have been waiting at the bridge start briskly up the river and a well-manned galley shoots through the arch the sitters cheering on the boats behind them which are not yet visible here they are is the general cry and through darts the first boat the men in her stripped to the skin and exerting every muscle to preserve the advantage they have gained four other boats follow close astern they are not two boats length between them the shouting is tremendous and the interest intense go on pink give it her red sullivan forever bravo george now tom now 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 why don't your partner stretch out two pots to a pint on yellow etc etc every little public-house fires its gun and hoists its flag and the men who win the heat come in amidst a splashing and shouting and banging in confusion which no one can imagine who has not witnessed it and of which any description would convey a very faint idea one of the most amusing places we know is the steam wharf of the london bridge or st catherine's dock company on a saturday morning in summer when the gravesend and margate steamers are usually crowded to excess and as we have just taken a glance at the river above bridge we hope our readers will not object to accompany us on board a gravesend packet coaches are every moment setting down at the entrance to the wharf and the stare of bewildered astonishment with which the fares resign themselves and their luggage into the hands of the porters who seize all the packages at once as a matter of course and run away with them heaven knows where is laughable in the extreme a margate boat lies alongside the wharf 
the gravesend boat which starts first lies alongside that again and as a temporary communication is formed between the two by means of a plank and handrail the natural confusion of the scene is by no means diminished gravesend inquires a stout father of a stout family who follow him under the guidance of their mother and a servant at the no small risk of two or three of them being left behind in the confusion gravesend pass on if you please sir replies the attendant other boat sir hereupon the stout father being rather mystified and the stout mother rather distracted by maternal anxiety the whole party deposit themselves in the margate boat and after having congratulated himself on having secured very comfortable seats the stout father sallies to the chimney to look for his luggage which he has a faint recollection of having given some man something to take somewhere no luggage however bearing the most remote resemblance to his own in shape or form is to be discovered on which the stout father calls very loudly for an officer to whom he states the case in the presence of another father of another family a little thin man who entirely concurs with him the stout father in thinking that it's high time something were done with these steam companies and that as the corporation bill failed to do it something else must for really people's property is not to be sacrificed in this way and that if the luggage isn't restored without delay he will take care it shall be put in the papers for the public is not to be the victim of these great monopolies to this the officer in his turn replies that that company ever since it has been st catherine's dock company has protected life and property that if it had been the london bridge wharf company indeed he shouldn't have wondered seeing that the morality of that company they being the opposition can't be answered for by no one but as it is he's convinced there must be some mistake or he wouldn't mind making a solemn oath afore a magistrate that the gentleman'll find his luggage afore he gets to margate here the stout father thinking he is making a capital point replies that as it happens he is not going to margate at all and that the passenger to gravesend was on the luggage in letters of full two inches long on which the officer rapidly explains the mistake and the stout mother and the stout children and the servant are hurried with all possible dispatch on board the gravesend boat which they reach just in time to discover that their luggage is there and that their comfortable seats are not then the bell which is the signal for the gravesend boat starting begins to ring most furiously and people keep time to the bell by running in and out of our boat at a double quick pace the bell stops the boat starts people who have been taking leave of their friends on board are carried away against their will and people who have been taking leave of their friends on shore find that they have performed a very needless ceremony in consequence of their not being carried away at all the regular passengers who have season tickets go below to breakfast people who have purchased morning papers compose themselves to read them and people who have not been down the river before think that both the shipping and the water look a great deal better at a distance when we get down about as far as blackwall and begin to move at a quicker rate the spirits of the passengers appear to rise in proportion old women who have brought large wicker hand-baskets with them set seriously to work at the demolition of heavy sandwiches and pass round a wine-glass which is frequently replenished from a flat bottle like a stomach-warmer with considerable glee handing it first to the gentleman in the foraging cap who plays the harp partly as an expression of satisfaction with his previous exertions and partly induce him to play dumble dum dairy for alec to dance to which being done alec who is a damp earthy child in red worsted socks takes certain small jumps upon the deck to the unspeakable satisfaction of his family circle girls who have brought the first volume of some new novel in their reticule become extremely plaintive and expatiate to mr brown or young mr o'brien who has been looking over them on the blueness of the sky and brightness of the water on which mr brown or mr o'brien as the case may be remarks in a low voice that he has been quite insensible of late to the beauties of nature that his whole thoughts and wishes have centred on one object alone whereupon the young lady looks up and failing in her attempt to appear unconscious looks down again and turns over the next leaf with great difficulty in order to afford opportunity for a lengthened pressure of the hand telescopes sandwiches and glasses of brandy and water cold without begin to be in great requisition and bashful men who have been looking down the hatchway at the engine find to their great relief a subject on which they can converse with one another and a copious one too steam 
wonderful thing steam sir ah a deep-drawn sigh it is indeed sir great power sir immense immense great deal done by steam sir ah another sigh at the immensity of the subject and a knowing shake of the head you may say that sir still in its infancy they say sir novel remarks of this kind are generally the commencement of a conversation which is prolonged until the conclusion of the trip and perhaps lays the foundation of a speaking acquaintance between half a dozen gentlemen who having their families at gravesend take season tickets for the boat and dine on board regularly every afternoon End of section 17